All right, everybody, let's get this lunchtime discovery series presentation going. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is the lunchtime discovery series. You've made it. It's Wednesday, 12 o'clock. We're here to learn something new from exciting and interesting people once again. My name is Chris Smith. I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, the group that brings you this program uh, through the internet every week. But this show is also brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. Them and us, we work together to put this show together and host it here on the museum's YouTube channel every Wednesday. So I'm so thankful for their help and support in the program, all the amazing work that Lisa and Marty do. And I'm thankful for all of you for tuning in every week to join us. We have great programs every week because we really do get some of the coolest people out there working in science, nature, and the environment to come onto the program and talk to us a little bit about their expertise, knowledge, insights, uh, and experiences. Today is no different. Today we're gonna be hearing from the public affairs officer and supervisor of that office from the Asheville Field Office of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, somebody whose job it is to tell stories of science and nature. That is Gary Peoples. Gary, welcome to the show. Well, I, I think it's definitely true. At least I saw it in a tweet, so I assume, I assume the best. It must be true. All right, we will go ahead and jump in. All right, Chris, does that look good on your end? Big thumbs up from me. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, uh, we were going to be uh, uh, spending the next few minutes here uh, looking at some photos and also I'm going to use the photos as a mechanism to talk about some of the uh, special places that we have here in the western part of the state and some of the really cool uh, species and activities going on to conserve those species and places. Uh, so this is a presentation of you from Mount Mitchell photographing southern Appalachian rare species and the people working to save them. Despite the title, that opening photo is not the view from Mount Mitchell. However, uh, that is the South Toe River, a uh, beautiful river, uh, one of our finest rivers here in the, in the western part of the state. Um, it actually rises um, on the edge of Mount Mitchell. The waters are on Mount Mitchell. So you walk that water upstream and you will come to Mount Mitchell. Uh, so so I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of what to expect from this presentation and then we will jump into the heart of it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, a little bit about our Asheville field office. Hey Gary, hold on. Uh, it's uh, Everybody in the chat is saying that we can't hear you. I can hear you, but they can't. Okay, chat folks, you're gonna have to help me out. You can hear me, but you can't hear Gary, is that correct? I'll give you a second to respond. You could hear Gary, but it wasn't very loud. So yeah, we might have to move you move you closer to your microphone. We can take care of that. I'm wondering if this is better. There's a 20 second delay between us and YouTube. So we'll know in just a moment. Sorry everybody.
Because I do have an external mic I could try to jack in, but I've never used it for this purpose. Well, um, let's see here. Sorry, everybody. For everybody watching at home, I can hear Gary just fine. So uh, it's not the microphones necessarily, it is the feed coming from my computer to yours. All right, let's, let's try again, Gary, and I'll keep working on this. That way you're talking, and I'll know in the chat if I get it fixed or not. All right, I will try to speak a little louder if that works, it's awesome. <clears throat> All right, so let's pick up where we left off. Um, thanks everyone for your patience, and thanks for tuning in to us today. Again, a little overview of what the presentation will be like. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Fish and Wildlife Service in my particular office's role. I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, how I approach photography. Uh, and then we'll take a closer look through photography at some special places and some special work that is going on. Uh, this particular photo was taken actually at Elk Knob State Park. Um, that is an adult dragonfly emerging from its uh, juvenile exoskeleton. Um, Dragonflies actually uh, spend much of their lives as aquatic creatures on the screen bottom, and it's only once they reach adulthood that they leave the water, undergo a metamorphosis, and become the flying insects that, uh, that we are all familiar with. Um, this is actually a view from Mount Mitchell. Just a little bit about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, in the United States, the vast majority of wildlife conservation, uh, wildlife management is handled by state agencies uh, in North Carolina. That's the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. <clears throat> However, there is a place for uh, a national perspective in wildlife conservation. Uh, this comes in with migratory birds and fish, things that cross state lines and even international boundaries. Uh, this comes in with the National Wildlife Refuge System, which is a system of federal lands that are dedicated to uh, wildlife conservation that we, the Fish and Wildlife Service, manage. Um, prominently here in North Carolina, these refuges are on our, on our coastline. You have Key Island, Alligator River, Pocosin Lakes, Madame Mesquite, and uh, several other refuges throughout the state. Uh, we are the agency that handles the enforcement and and administration of federal wildlife laws. Um, this is includes things like uh, laws pertaining to trade in international uh, in an international wildlife international trade in wildlife parts and, and creatures. 
So when things are, when people are smuggling parrots from South America, it's our law enforcement that gets involved. Uh, things like elephant ivory trade, we get involved. And we are a keeper of the federal threatened and endangered species list, and we work to uh, recover plants and animals and other species that are on that list. So, a little bit about our office. Um, we have an Asheville field office. That is where I am located here in the western part of the state. The things that we do out of our office, uh, we are involved in project review. There are several federal laws that, um, that ask federal agencies when they fund or administer uh, or approve projects um, that they review those, that those projects be reviewed for their impact to fish, wildlife, and plants, and we help with that process. Uh, we are play a big role in imperiled species recovery here in the western part of the state, not only plants and animals that are on the threatened and endangered species list, but also those that are not on that list, and we are working hard to keep off. Let's also help, help determine what species need Endangered Species Act protection from our neck of the woods. Uh, this particular photo right here was taken off the Blue Ridge Parkway. We were out evaluating um, some uh, pollinator habitats. There is a, recently the Fish and Wildlife Service placed a bumblebee, the rusty patch bumblebee, on the federal threatened and endangered species list. Um, historically known from North Carolina, though not currently known, but we would like it, that to change one day, and we'd like to have that bumblebee uh, back eventually. So. Shifting gears, that's kind of the overview of the agency and the office. Now let's shift gears to uh, the photography a little bit. Um, kind of how did I get started in this? I've been in this office about 20 years now. And when I came in, again, as Chris mentioned, I was hired into this public affairs, the communication uh, role, and we had a desperate need for photographs. We had had some biologists um, Dick Biggins had taken some excellent photos of fish and mussels. Bob Curry had taken some excellent cave and bat photos, but we still needed more. And we had reached a situation, we had a handful of excellent photos, but those photos were showing up in every fact sheet, brochure, every product we had. And it was, wasn't doing justice to the story uh, that we wanted to tell, the story of these creatures, these places, and all the wonderful work going into conserving them. And of course, with the advent of digital media, the need for imagery has just exploded. Uh, everything from web pages to, to social media even. Um, this particular photo, that's our biologist Sue Cameron in the foreground. She's a terrestrial zoologist. In the background is Gabrielle Grader with the Wildlife Resources Commission. Uh, this is a survey of bats in an abandoned mine, uh, actually within Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, so a little bit about how I approach photography, which will set the stage for the kind of the rest of the photos um, that we see. I don't consider myself a nature photographer, um, you know, not a wildlife photographer, not a natural landscape photographer. Um, I uh, come at it more from a documentary standpoint. There are a lot of outstanding nature photographers here in North Carolina, and I don't know that I have have anything that I can add to what they are producing to, to kind of document the beautiful areas and beautiful creatures of our state. Uh, but from my position, what I can do is document the work that's going into conserving these areas. And in a few cases, which we'll talk about later, I can document these species directly in ways that perhaps other people can. So really more of a documentary photographer than a nature photographer. Um, yeah, and also my background is kind of more on the photojournalism, uh, street photography, documentary photography realm. So that's a realm that I'm far more comfortable in. Um, I'm not a big gearhead, but I know some folks are interested, and if folks wanted to learn what I was shooting with, or, or more importantly, if folks were interested in, in shooting themselves, um, here's what I use 
our our office gear, our my official gear, um, uh, the Canon EOS M6 Mark I. Um, it's kind of the standard. That is a mirrorless camera. I also always like to have a, a point and shoot, kind of as a backup, whenever I'm in the field. Uh, so my point and shoot is the Sony RX100 Mark VII, and then we also have an old Canon uh, 7D Mark I, uh, which is a bit of workhorse. It's it's a little long in the tooth. Uh, you really only use it as a backup. It's also a, a heavy camera to be toting around in the field. My personal gear, Sony Alpha 6400, and my personal point and shoot backup is the Canon G7X Mark II. And for uh, cataloging, keeping everything in order and doing whatever tweaks, you know, tweaking the contrast, making areas lighter, darker, I use uh, Lightroom as my software. So now we're gonna get into the heart of it. That's a lot of background, but let's take a, take a little tour of the Western part of the state and take a look at some pictures. Uh, we're gonna go through, it's funny, you know, I work in endangered species conservation and there are certain places, certain types of habitats or concentrations of habitats that tend to have high concentrations of federally uh, endangered and threatened species. Uh, and these, not surprisingly, these habitats are often rare habitats. These include Southern Appalachian bogs, our high elevation habitats like uh, grassy bogs, uh, spruce fir forests, some of our river basins, and our caves and mines and other bad habitat. Uh, Western North Carolina doesn't have a ton of caves, especially compared to other areas like Tennessee and Kentucky, but we do have a fair number of, uh, of old mines. Uh, first thing we're gonna jump into is our mountain bogs. The mountains are not known for their wetlands. Um, obviously in Eastern North Carolina, we have our large Pocosins and lots of wetland area. That doesn't happen in the mountains. They don't get much chance for water to pool up in the mountains, uh, for the soil to get saturated, for plant communi communities to develop on the saturated soil, but it does happen in a few places. Uh, this particular photo here is a flower from a mountain sweet pitcher plant, which is one of our uh, federally protected uh, in these mountain bogs. Um, this is a flower from a uh, mountain purple pitcher plant. Uh, these are flowers. Pitcher plants are more famously known not for their flowers, but for their pitchers. They are carnivorous plants um, eating attracting and, and digesting insects as a source of, of nutrients. The one on the previous slide, the uh, mountain sweet pitcher plant is federally protected. This one, the mountain purple pitcher plant is not protected under the Endangered Species Act. However, we have been asked to place it on the endangered species list. So before long, we will be evaluating it to see if it warrants endangered species protection. Uh, this is another bog plant. You can see it's it's literally growing uh, in water there, uh, going all the way down to the submerged soil. Uh, this is bunched arrowhead. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that one in a minute. But beautiful little plant, little white flower. Uh, again, found only in these southern Appalachian mountain bogs. Um, so... You can kind of divide. Uh, this is bunch arrowhead. What's that, Chris? Oh, that wasn't me. Oh. All right, we will go on. Um, you can kind of uh, divide rare species conservation work into, into one of two activities, either habitat management or population management. <clears throat> and across those two spectrums, we, in those two areas, we, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, often provide funding, provide technical assistance in those areas, uh, and just kind of general guidance in those areas. 
Um, this is yet, this is one of our former biologists uh, working with green pitcher plants. Yet a third carnivorous plant that grows in these Appalachian bogs. This one is also like the mountain sweet, also protected under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, in this case, we were actually helping the landowner. Uh, it's a private landowner, but they uh, are actively engaged in conserving these pitcher plants. And we were helping them uh, fulfill their monitoring plan, going out periodically and seeing just how many of these green pitcher plants are growing and looking at the, the trends that are happening with that population. Uh, so a little, a little uh, kind of basic sliver of population management. Uh, this photo features Dr. Becca Hale of the University of North Carolina at Asheville. Another thing we do in our office and as an agency is fund research that helps guide management of these rare species. Um, and this is an interesting site, actually someone's backyard, private, private homeowner's backyard who is very interested in conserving these rare species. You can see the rare pitcher plants and we uh, have funded uh, Dr. Hale to study, um, you know, we talked about these plants being carnivorous. Dr. Hale is studying the insect and other small creatures, insect communities and other small creatures that, uh, that form up around these pitcher plants and what we actually see going on regarding insects in the pitchers. This little guy, this is a baby bog turtle, um, perhaps the cutest uh, creature we work with, uh, even rivaling perhaps baby Yoda and cuteness. Look at those ginormous eyes looking out at you. Uh, bog turtle is North America's smallest turtle. Um, unfortunately, one of the threats that it faces is actually illegal trade. These are popular in uh, the illegal trade, illegal pet trade. So it's something uh, both our law enforcement officers and state uh, game wardens keep an eye out for. Uh, very sad story, but we are we are working on it. Uh, this is what a baby bog turtle looks like. It's being measured. Uh, the height of its shell is being measured by a, a technician with the, with the Wildlife Resources Commission. And that is what an adult bog turtle looks like. That one is getting, uh, getting weighed by, again, Gabrielle Grader, biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, this site. This is a, a, one of our biologists, Sue Cameron. Again, this site is owned, well, at the time it was owned by a land conservancy. Um, believe it or not, what you're looking at, and Sue came out, they wanted to help to get an idea of what creatures lived on this site. Uh, so Sue went out to help them with a bird inventory. Believe it or not, what you're looking at used to be a tomato farm. Before it was a tomato farm, it was one of these Southern Appalachian bogs. The water was drained, <clears throat> ditched, so it, flew, so it flowed over to the nearby creek. And then tomatoes were grown there for several years. Um, however, it came into conservation ownership. Uh, our office helped fund the restoration of this site. Uh, restored the wetlands, undid the ditch, put some meanders back into the stream, set it up so uh, the soil would be inundated with water, the area would periodically flood. And what you see is you see this beautiful meadow and the, the, the site has really become a success story. If you'll think back to the uh, little white flower, the bunched arrowhead, it grows at this particular site. Um, <clears throat> before this wetland restoration, it had most recently seen, been seen as a single plant that was just floating in the ditch that had lost its, its rooting in the ground and was just floating in the ditch. However, after we did this restor restoration, we found that there was a massive seed bank in the soil. And afterwards, hundreds of these plants uh, flourished at this site. Very exciting story for a rare plant. Um, this is uh, our former botanist. She's still with our office, but she's no longer a botanist, Rebecca Reed. Again, a situation where we were helping a private landowner do some 
Habitat management. This is a site where we had rare pitcher plants, in fact, federally protected pitcher plants. And one thing about these bogs is they, the plants that live there typically like a lot of sunshine. So managing them is often a wrestling match to, to push back uh, overgrowth. Be sure those, those plants get the sunshine that they need. This is a situation where we work with a private landowner to, to cut back some of that overstory. There were some maples, red maples here. There was some uh, rhododendron around the edges that we wanted to trim back. And here she is setting up a monitoring plot so we can track uh, the impact this has on the rare on the rare pitcher plants. Speaking of habitat management, this is a photo of a former intern of ours, David Caldwell. This was a, we were all out to help yet another private landowner, in this case, the Episcopal Church, uh, manage a site that they had. We managed to get some students from Haywood Community College out, and I believe Warren Wilson College students were also out on this day. They were a beaver problem. Uh, Bogs, obviously we want there to be plenty of water in bogs, but beaver had come to this bog and we had too much water. So what you see them working on is a leveler. So this large PVC pipe before David, uh, what you would do is you would notch the beaver dam, you would drop this PVC, PVC pipe into the beaver dam that outlet that's just in front of them, you would turn it 90 degrees so it's facing up and it would be on the upstream side of the beaver dam so that when the water reached a certain level behind the dam, instead of continuing to flood back up into, into the area, it would instead overflow into this PVC pipe and the water would flow downstream. So uh, for us, it meant that we didn't have too much water backing up in the system but the beavers could still be there and hang out and have their dam and hopefully, hopefully be happy. So another example of, of habitat management in mountain bogs. Um, this is a, one component that we do across all these is all these habitats is some is education and outreach. Uh, this is uh, Ed Schwartzman, formerly of the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. Actually, we helped there's a community of bog conservationists. We helped organize this day out in a box so folks could learn about these habitats and the plants that live there. And this is Ed um, just teaching us, showing us, helping us identify some of these bog plants. Now we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna go from the wetlands up to the mountaintops. Western North Carolina uh, has the highest peaks east of the Mississippi. Of course, we have Mount Mitchell, the highest peak east of the Mississippi. I looked it up once. Of the four, 49 of the 50 highest peaks east of the Mississippi were in the Southern Appalachians, essentially divided between North Carolina and Tennessee. Um, New Hampshire's Mount Washington was the only one that was not in the Southeast. Um, these high elevation areas have some unique habitats. Um, our grassy bogs are known for to be beautiful hiking destinations. They are also home to some some rare species, and in some cases, imperiled species. These areas are home to spruce fir forests, to to high elevation rocky outcrops. In this photo, you can see there's a plant growing on this rocky cliff. You can see the uh, yellow flowers. That is a federally protected plant, spreading avens, um, and it grows here on these exceptionally hard to reach high elevation uh, rocky outcrops. And in the upper left, this was a, was a drizzly, foggy day. You can see someone rappelling down the, uh, down the cliff face. Um, it's a going effort to, to monitor all these spreading avens populations in Western North Carolina and get a really good idea of how well they are doing and what the future holds for them. Um, this is one, another one of the creatures, the rare creatures that we encounter at these uh, high elevation habitats. You see on the right, there's a tiny spider there. That is the spruce fir moss spider. 
Uh, again, protected under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, to give a little bit of scale, um, he, when we found this, this spider, we were fortunate enough in that it had its egg sac with it. That egg sac it has with it is about the size of a BB. Uh, so extremely small, these, these folks live, these spiders live in moss mats of a certain species of moss that are growing on certain areas on the forest floor beneath the spruce fir forest. So very limited habitat. And, um, you know, I, at, the, at the opening, I mentioned, you know, that I couldn't contribute that my style of photography was more documentary and that there was a lot of nature, wildlife, landscape photography that's really good. And I'm not sure I could contribute to that. But in the case of a, a creature like the spruce fir moth spider, um, it lives in these spruce fir uh, mats on the forest floor. It's hard to access. Um, very few people know what they're looking for when to find, trying to find the habitats. Um, and it's a, just a tough creature to find. And in fact, to find one, you have to pull apart the moss and look in, which does um, damage its habitat. So we like to minimize that as much as possible. And so with my position, what I'm able to do is basically tag along with biologists who are doing this work. And then when something like this happens, we see the spider with the egg sac, I can then jump in, grab the photo and jump out and we carry on. I don't really like the idea of, of disturbing or harassing uh, creatures, especially these imperiled creatures, uh, for the sake of getting a picture of them. So one thing that uh, my position affords me is the ability to follow along in the in the conservation work and use that opportunity to snag photos of our rare creatures. Um, again, to help give you a little bit of perspective, this is our biologist Sue Cameron. She is has one of those spiders in that little cap. She's looking at it with a with a hand lens. Uh, working to identify it. So really, really tiny creature. One of the hardest things I've ever photographed, most challenging things. It presents a host of challenges. Uh, this is also Sue. Um, so these high elevation forests, very special places. We call them mountaintop or sky, sky islands, mountaintop islands because you have these patches of habitat that exist only on the tops of these highest peaks. Uh, so from an elevational standpoint, they are functionally islands. Um, we are trying to learn about these islands, uh, especially um, as we consider the impacts of climate change. Uh, one thing that we have done is set up a network of data loggers that collects, routinely collects data on temperature and humidity. And I think uh, we have these set up to collect that at five minute intervals. Um, and so here Sue has gone out, she's climbed up in a tree and she is downloading the data logger. Data loggers get downloaded every six months or so. And that data is brought in to kind of give us a, a longer picture, a longer term picture of what's going on uh, at these sites, at least in terms of humidity and temperature, which are two key uh, uh, climate variables for this this area. Um, same thing going on here, same person, same activity. I just threw this picture in because it's cool and it shows field life during the time of COVID. Sue's got her, her mask on. We weren't too far from a fairly heavily used trail here. So um, decent number of, of hikers that we encountered to, to get this data. Um, again, going back to the concept of habitat management, a um, hundred years ago when the Southern Appalachians were heavily logged, um, there was little consideration given to replanting the area or um, what we would consider today uh, responsible forestry and tree harvesting. Uh, so you had extensive logging in the Southern Appalachians. This was followed by extensive forest fires. Um, one of the impacts of that is we lost a lot of red spruce in our mountain forests. But we are part of an effort underway to return red spruce. It's called the Southern Appalachian Spruce Restoration Initiative. Um, and we are in the midst of literally planting out 
thousands of red spruce trees on these mountaintop islands. These folks are in a forest. This site is actually on the Cherokee National Forest just across the state line, but they are prepping sites for planting some of these red spruce trees. Um, again, these folks are, are on the cusp of going out and planting hundreds. This was in Graham County, this particular site along the Cherahala Skyway. Uh, this particular planting, those are buckets full of the red spruce. Um, the woman there on the right is Kelly Holbrooks. Um, she is executive director of the uh, organization that is growing many of these red spruce trees. And she's helping out with a planting here on Pisgah National Forest, actually not too far from graveyard fields for those of you familiar with that area. Again, same, same planting site. You can see the, the red spruce trees lined up there, but this is the team. We have forest service people out. We have volunteers out. Uh, we have all these Ingalls grocery store bags. You would fill up the bag with the red spruce trees and take them out into the forest to the planting site where teams would be putting them in the ground. Uh, this is back, uh, this was a technician with the Wildlife Resources Commission planting a red spruce tree uh, back over on the Cherahala Skyway in Graham County on the western edge of the state. Uh, this is again our own Sue Cameron uh, planting a tree. This is the Cherokee National Forest site where she's planting her tree there. And now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to leave the mountain tops behind and go downhill uh, until we hit water and talk about some of our southern Appalachian mountain streams. Um, this particular photo was taken in the French Broad River. Uh, we do have an endangered mussel, the Appalachian elk toe, uh, which lives in the French Broad River and, and uh, a handful of its tributaries, the Mills River, the Little River. Um, really cool story, the Appalachian elk toe mussel. Um, for those who are unaware, mussels are, are bivalve mollusks like clams or oysters. However, um, there are hundreds of species of freshwater mussels, different from the marine mussels that you order in restaurants, but hundreds of species in the world of freshwater mussels. Uh, the southeastern United States is a global center of mussel diversity. And here in the French Broad, we have the endangered Appalachian elk toe mussel. These are cool creatures. They sit on the stream bottom. They are filter feeders. They eat bacteria, algae, other things that are up in the water column. So they suck in that water, they filter it out to get what they need and they return clean water to the stream. So they are actually cleaning the water as they're sitting on the stream bottom, just doing their thing. Uh, this is a part of a program we did several years ago. We worked with the Wildlife Resources Commission um, and some of the big rafting companies out in Western North Carolina to basically teach the river, the river raft guides about the ecology of these rivers. So here they are learning about the fish of the French Broad River uh, in the hopes that uh, they could turn around and share this knowledge with their clients and they could also provide their clients uh, with a more interesting and well-rounded um, river, river, river rafting experience. Uh, speaking of mussels, this photo comes to us from the Little Tennessee River Basin. In fact, the actual Little Tennessee River itself. Uh, this is uh, game lands, the Need More Game Lands, managed by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. These two biologists um, are doing, an doing a survey for mussels, an inventory. They're seeing, basically getting an idea of how many mussels are out there. Uh, that red, that orange, Square you see underwater is made of rebar. It sits on the stream bottom. It is one quarter of a square meter. And what they will do is they will dig down in that substrate through all the sand and gravel and rocks and pull out and count and identify all the mussels that they find in that, in that randomly selected piece of stream bottom. So that's, that's one of the more thorough ways 
that we have to get an idea of how muscle populations are doing in a, in a particular stream or a particular stream reach. Um, this is one of our former biologists, Bob Butler. That is the Appalachian elk toe. You see in his left hand, there are more on the trade that, that is before him. Um, this was actually a population. Remember going back to the habitat management and population management. This was a population management project. We were actually um, moving some of these mussels from a river that had a very vibrant population into another river where the population had taken a hit. So we are essentially stocking a river with these. Um, and in this, in this case, he is simply uh, putting a tag on it. So if someone finds this muscle in the future, um, we know a little bit about its history. A similar photo here, similar event. Uh, but what I like is you can, you can see the series of activities in this, in this photograph, in the foreground, you can see there's a muscle that's being measured and then working away towards the background, there's someone uh, recording the data. And then at the back, uh, we have former State Wildlife Commission technician, Tiffany Penland, who is tagging the muscles that will go into, into the river. Um, this is a photo, a portrait, really, of Lori Williams, again, a Wildlife Resources Commission biologist. They are, she's part of a team here that is searching for eastern hellbenders, um, North America's largest salamander, therefore, obviously, North Carolina's largest salamander, are uh, really cool creatures. Um, they were actually, we considered them for inclusion on the endangered species list uh, two or three, four years ago. Um, through that process of collecting and analyzing all the data about the hellbender, uh, we discovered that they're essentially kind of genetically four large populations, include one of which is the Southern Appalachian population. <clears throat> of those four, it's the Southern Appalachian, which includes Western North Carolina, which is doing the best. And because of that, um, we decided that the Eastern hellbender, at least the Southern Appalachian population, did not need that Endangered Species Act protection. Hopefully, hopefully that will not change in the future. Uh, I included this photo just because I think it's uh, compositionally, it's a fun photo, you know, the repetition, the, 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 the lines, the, the shifting size there. Um, what this crew is doing, this is the Tuckasegee River um, up there in the on the left, you have T.R. Russ, who's with the Wildlife Resources Commission. In the center, you have uh, his technician. And on the right, you have Dave McHenry, who currently works for the North Carolina Department of Transportation as a biologist for them. But they are actually collecting uh, Appalachian elk toe mussels, the endangered mussel we saw before. And the animals they collect, they are looking for females that have a lot of larval mussels. Um, and so what they will do is take those and what they what they collected here, uh, they take into captivity. Um, there's a part of the state hatchery in Marion, contains the conservation aquaculture lab, uh, where our rarest mussels, North Carolina's rarest mussels are bred in captivity including the Appalachian elk toe, uh, so they can then be used to stock places, uh, stock river reaches that have good habitat, but may not currently have a lot of mussels. Um, what you see here, this is Rachel Hoke. She runs that conservation aquaculture lab. Um, and that tray before her, beneath the lights, those are dozens, scores, maybe even hundreds of very small juvenile mussels that, that uh, she's growing in her lab. And actually she's doing an inventory, they do a periodic inventory where they count every single muscle in the lab. And that's what she's doing. You can see she has the counter there in, in the uh, left hand, in her left hand. This is a really cool story. Something that we've really made a lot of strides in in recent years is this ability to propagate muscle, rare mussels in captivity so they can be used for stocking when we have really good 
stream reaches, good habitat that um, maybe used to have mussels and the mussels died off and now the habitat's better so we can put mussels back. Um, really good, really good capacity. And again, this gets at uh, really population management, going, again, going back to the notion of habitat versus population management. This is, this is the, the spirit of population management. Uh, that's state biologist T.R. Russ on the left. He's holding up a mussel. This is in the uh, Little Tennessee River. They were actually doing a survey this day uh, for a threat, federally threatened fish, the spot fin chub, and T.R. happened to come across that mussel. But this outing was part of a long-term effort to really get a good idea of how well the spot fin chub is doing uh, in the Little Tennessee River. Uh, this is a really cool project here. That fish you see on the board being measured is a sickle fin red horse. It's a large fish. It's a, su it's a sucker, a bottom dweller. In the entire world, this fish is only found in the tip of western North Carolina and uh, just a sliver of North Georgia. Years ago, we considered it for inclusion on the endangered species list. Um, in the end, we decided not to put it on that list, but also in the end, a number of partners stepped up to help conserve it so it would not ever, hopefully, need Endangered Species Act protection. So we are part of the effort, the Wildlife Resources Commission, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, Duke Energy was a huge partner, the Eastern ba Band of Cherokee Indians, um, the state of Georgia, uh, this woman on the left, Crystal Rubel, is with a Knoxville-based nonprofit that focuses on fish conservation, Conservation Fisheries Incorporated. And so <clears throat> there's this massive conservation effort for this fish to keep it off the endangered species list to help its survival. Um, it includes what you see here. She's, Curator Crystal is just helping collect some data on the fish. That fish was caught in the river. It will be returned to the river. Uh, on the right, you see our biologist, Jay Mays. He's holding out a syringe. That syringe, uh, I think that syringe will be used to place a, um, a pit tag. When we talk about, you know, chipping, you're putting a computer chip into your pets. This is what we're talking about. There's a little tag that we will put in that fish that has a unique, unique identifier. And then later we can use a tag reader to read that unique identifier and um, see where that fish has gone, where, where other people have picked it up on their, on their tag readers. So it's a way for us to track where fish move, when they move, um, that kind of thing. Uh, part of this project is also captive propagation of these fish, again, to help with stocking uh, populations that are small and could use a boost. Um, this is actually uh, the collection of sperm from this sickle fin red horse, which will then be used in the lab to fertilize um, sickle fin red horse eggs that are harvested separately. And then they can all, the, the, the fertilized eggs can be raised in captivity, which drastically reduces the mortality rate from the wild and those offspring can be used to, to boost <coughs> populations. Uh, this picture comes, um, actually it's just outside of us. It's up in Southwest Virginia. But again, one of the rarest creatures in the world, the golden riffle shell mussel, only occurs in a tiny little stretch of Southwest Virginia, um, but it was captively propagated. Again, going back to that, that talking about the, the, the lab propagation of these rare species. And now this, um, in this case, in this day, it was being reintroduced are stocked into the uh, Clinch River in Southwest Virginia. Um, and there you can see one of the mussels, it has this little tag, it's being one of these golden riffle shell mussels, it's being returned to the, to the stream bottom. And, you know, I do want to take a second, go back to, you know, I talked about equipment at the beginning. This photo here was just taken with an iPhone. Um, so, you know, Everyone has, nearly everyone has a camera in their pocket. You don't necessarily need any fancy equipment. You have that camera, so, you know, 
if you're interested, that's an excellent place to start the camera in your pocket. Um, education, in the home stretch here. Education is a big thing that we do when it comes to aquatic conservation. Uh, the challenge with conserving stream river species is that the river quality can be affected by any number of things that happen upstream. So I view education to be exceptionally important when it comes to conserving aquatic species. This photo comes to us from the Tuckasegee River. This was a pair of Jackson County teachers who were attending um, a workshop that we were given. Giving This is actually was an It's Our Water workshop, uh, which is coordinated by, by the state there. And they are working to identify some aquatic insects that they had collected there in the Tuckasegee River. Another It's Our Water workshop, this one was up in Mitchell County, that's the North Joe River, and those teachers are uh, collecting data to enable them to get a stream profile. And then there are activities where you can get the stream velocity, and then you can apply some math to have all sorts of fun uh, calculating things like discharge for the stream. Uh, here's one of our biologists, uh, Brian Tompkins. We, our office supports a number of efforts here in the western part of the state, what we call generally kids in the creek events that take uh, students, um, either fifth graders or eighth graders out into a stream in their community to, to learn about the stream. And we usually help them uh, collect and identify stream invertebrates. Um, this also in the North Toe River in Mitchell County. Brian's helping, um, helping the students identify some of their creatures. Uh, this is the South Show River. Again, this is the river that we saw on the opening slide. And in fact, it's the same spot. That opening slide was taken on the bank on the right there. Uh, one of our biologists, Byron Hampstead, helping some students um, pull some insects out of their kick net. Love the South Toe River. It's one of my favorites. Uh, Wildlife Resources Commission biologist Andrea Leslie. This was on Cartuga Jay Creek, which is a tributary to the Little Tennessee River. Uh, so Macon County students here learning about um, stream invertebrates in Cartuga Jay Creek. Uh, Tanya Poole, also with the Wildlife Resources Commission, uh, helping students learn about this stream insect. This one was on the Pigeon River in Haywood County. Um, Students, uh, this was a fish station. We're learning about fish now. Also on the North Toe River, the students are lined up and they are driving fish into that saying that the biologist has strung across a portion of the stream. Uh, Avery County, Newland, the middle school up there has an outstanding science teacher who works really hard to get her students out into uh, the North Toe River, which which begins right outside Newland. Those are some of the some Avery County students in the North Toe River, right up near where the river begins. Again, this is Haywood County. This is the Pigeon River, named for the passenger pigeon, once North America's most common bird, now driven to extinction. But the Pigeon River in Haywood County, Haywood County Waterways has been doing these kids in the creek events, I think for 25 years now, longer than anyone else uh, consecutively in Western North Carolina. And they bring out every single eighth grader in Haywood County. So for more than a generation now, every eighth grader in Haywood County has had this experience where they get to go out to the Pigeon River, learn about it, explore about it, have a good time in it. So it's an outstanding program that they're doing at Haywood Waterways. Again, same, same situation, Pigeon River. These are eighth graders in Haywood County uh, collecting stream invertebrates to identify. The Pigeon River is also home uh, to the Appalachian elk toe mussel, the endangered mussel that we saw earlier. <clears throat> uh, more students, again, this is the fish. They're collecting fish out of that same. This was, this was on the South Toe River in Yancey County. Yancey County fifth graders here. And these are actually UNC Asheville students um, 
these guys were snorkeling the Little River in Transylvania County, which is also home. It's a tributary to the French Broad River, also home to the Appalachian elk toe mussel. These uh, students were fellows of a program that UNCA has for students um, who have tremendous interest and tremendous potential in conservation. And not just the sciences, the two uh, women with their mask on kind of in the center uh, were biology and environmental studies majors. The woman to the right was an art major. The gentleman standing up on the left was a sociology major. So they're kind of looking at it from a multidisciplinary perspective, uh, which is really cool. All these were really wonderful students that we took out. Uh, bringing it home with caves and mines, and then we'll conclude. Um, these are a couple of biologists preparing to, to survey bats. Uh, this is what uh, cave work and mine work when white, white nose syndrome was first an issue, suiting up to ensure that the that spores are not passed from, the, the fungal spores related to white nose syndrome are not passed from site to site. Um, we already saw this slide taken at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This cave is actually not a cave, it's a mine. It's an abandoned mine in Haywood County. This picture was taken actually about a year ago. This site was once the, the most populous uh, hibernacula for, hibernaculum for um, bats in North Carolina. At its peak, there were about 35, 3,300, 3,500 bats who wintered here. Uh, we went in a year ago and there were 66 from 3,300 to 66, and that is because of white nose syndrome and its impacts on bat populations here in Western North Carolina. Um, going back to population management and just having population data to guide management, this is from a bat blitz. Every year, typically, um, bat biologists across the Southeast come together and do what's called a bat blitz. This one was in, based at Crossnor in Avery County, where we, uh, dozens, scores of biologists come together and collect a massive amount of data on bats over a few days. Uh, here we are, biologists checking the wing for white nose syndrome damage, shows up in scarring on the wings. Uh, same here, this particular bat, um, is a gray bat, it's a federally protected bat. This photo was actually taken in Asheville, North Carolina. The gray bat was recently discovered uh, here in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and in fact, there's a project underway to really get a firm handle of how many gray bats we have in the French Broad River Basin, which includes Asheville, and all the areas that, we, that they use, all the areas that are important for them. This is a biologist who's a part of that project that uh, being carried out by Indiana State University, and she's actually weighing a bat right there. Uh, part of that study, this is a bat. You see in the bat there in the center, and there's actually a, a transmitter being glued to its back that will allow people, biologists, to track where it goes. And that's how you find out where it's roosting, and it's roosting with other bats, so you find out um, kind of the migration corridors these bats use and also the roost they use. Um, eventually that transmitter will fall off the bat and the bat will be none the worse for wear. So that's about one hour and that's really the end of my presentation. Uh, but I do want to stress, I don't think I stress this enough. You know, that's kind of my story and approach to photography. Um, but I'm just one person in a state full of people who are interested in, in our outdoors and our incredible natural resources. Um, I would like to see more folks. I want to see more stories that people have of the great outdoors. You know, I mentioned the cell phones, taking photos is easier now than it's been in the history of humankind. And we have this beautiful state with tons of beautiful outdoor stories to tell. Um, so I encourage all of you to, to, to be a part of capturing and telling that story. And that's really it. There's my email if you want it. Every photo that you have seen here today is in the public domain. It was taken 
in my role as a, an employee of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So those photos <clears throat> belong to the American people, and you can get them all at that website right there. Chris, that's all I got. Thank you, everyone, for taking your time, and, and, and Chris and Michael for your technical support. Gary, thank you so much. Excellent stuff and just gorgeous photography. Uh, we could probably sit here all day and just scroll. In fact, I might do that for the rest of the day is just go to the Flickr album and, and just start Don't let scrolling me stop through you. pictures. All right, let's see. I'm going to drop us out of screen sharing here and we'll start taking questions from the audience. So I'll remind everybody that uh, if you have questions, drop them into the chat box on YouTube and I'll be grabbing those and we'll ask Gary. But uh, one of the things that was striking me going looking at all of the different projects that Fish and Wildlife has going on in the Southern Appalachians and all of the different parts of North Carolina and Tennessee and Georgia that you're roaming over, how do you even begin to prioritize which places or species or projects you're going to photograph or document uh, on any given day? Because it just seems like there's so much happening. There, there, there is a lot happening. And the reality is a lot of it doesn't get photographed. Um, I wish I could say I had some grand scheme to, to document all these species and all these projects. But frankly, Chris, it's very opportunistic. The, the opportunity to take photos and the taking of photos is, is frankly a tiny uh, sliver of what I do. So it's something that gets squeezed in when possible. And sometimes that really works out nicely. Um, sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, uh, there's a bog plant called the swamp pink. It lives in the pink beds on Pisgah National Forest, so a nice you know, public site, trail system. I've been trying to get out there and photograph it and bloom for two or three years, but the timing just doesn't work out for me. So I wish I could say I had some grand scheme, but I don't. It's just taking advantage of opportunities that come up, really. Yeah, yeah, excellent stuff. Okay, uh, let me see what's going on here in the chat. The, let's see, Stephen is asking, will the... Fish and Wildlife Service continue to restrict all people from roasting caves to prevent the spread of white nose syndrome. Does roasting make sense to you? It doesn't to me. Maybe visiting caves. Visiting caves makes sense. Um, Stephen, that's a good question. Um, you know, at the end of the day, whether or not one goes is able to go into a cave or a mine is up to the landowner where that site is. Um, so it's not our say, our recommendation. We've had recommendations that uh, that people not enter um, the mines based on white nose syndrome and the fear of spreading white nose syndrome. Um, and there have been caves that have remained open um, as white nose syndrome came on the scene and has white nose syndrome has spread, but there have caves that have remained closed. And it really depends on the on the landowner at this point. And um, it's not, you know, it's not our say we can make recommendations and the landowners also take into consideration uh, their own responsibilities for the natural resources and the and the, um, the safety of their land visitors. Um, so yeah, it's really up to the landowners what, what happens now. The smart people watching the show, uh, roosting caves, not mm. roasting, roosting. There's a lot happening over here, everybody. I'm so sorry for being dumb. Can you suggest how to get involved as a volunteer with some of these kinds of projects and endeavors? Yes. Um, again, I said at the outset that the vast majority of wildlife conservation and management is done at the state level in our state by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, and the reality is, you know, they do far more on the ground work than we do at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
So I would recommend uh, reaching out to the Wildlife Resources Commission to see what kind of volunteer opportunities uh, they have. Um, you can go, their website is ncwildlife.org um, and that will give you a good start. And they have a, you know, a contact section where you can identify someone to reach out to. I think they also have uh, like a hotline on their website that you could call <clears throat> and get some, get some feedback on, on how to connect with someone who can use you as a volunteer. Good advice there. Similarly, Crystal is asking if you had any tips for folks that do photography, are the best way for them to reach out to organizations that could benefit from their help? I think that's an outstanding, Crystal, uh, an outstanding question, Crystal. I'd love to hear it because um, I love it when good organizations doing good things have good photography. Um, if I was you, I would pick an organization that is doing conservation either in an area that interests you, a geographic area of the state or nation that interests you, or doing conservation in, say, with a particular taxonomic group, like with fishes or trout, like Trout Unlimited, and reach out to them because, <clears throat> and, you know, tell them that you're interested in, in supporting them through photography and providing some volunteering with photography, providing them with pictures. And I got to think that they would jump at the opportunity. But I think, you know, I think a good first step is, is selecting um, something in the conservation realm, be it a particular area on the landscape or a particular species or group of species and find somebody who's working in that area or with those creatures and then, and then reach out to them. Excellent stuff. And let's see. Last, I think this will be the last one, but it's a good one. NCMNS teacher education. Hi, Megan, Melissa, whoever happens to be there. I couldn't help but noticing, as I've been trying to pay more attention to this myself lately, that there weren't very many black people in your photographs. Is trying to pay more attention and photograph more BIPOC scientists something that the UF USFWS will attempt to do moving forward? Um, absolutely. Um, that is very much an interest of ours in general. It's very much an interest of mine personally, and it's definitely something that we are, that I am looking at how to address. Um, and we are working on it. Um, it's a challenge uh, working in the western part of the state. Many of the rural areas where we work are extremely white, frankly. Um, so we may not have the opportunity to, there are bigger issues of engaging communities of color there beyond simply photography. Um, <clears throat> but it's definitely something that we are considering. In fact, for the French Broad River Basin, um, we're having a meeting next week to talk about um, kind of those issues. Uh, we have a partnership discussing um, those issues of diversity and inclusion that, you know, reach way beyond the imagery that we use into, you know, meaningful engagement and inclusion. So definitely, definitely something on our radar screen and something that we're working on. Good to hear it. Good to hear it. All right, folks, I'm gonna call time on our program today. Thanks so much for sticking with us while I was trying to work out everything that was going on uh, in the old internet tubes. I just didn't start the car early enough, I think. Didn't get the engine warm and then slammed it into gear. That's what we got. Uh, Gary, thank you so much. Uh, your presentation was beautiful and your insight, very insightful. Uh, I'm probably gonna go back, folks, and tinker with the video. Maybe I'll get a new version uploaded where I'll fix the audio in the beginning. That way we have a great resource for everybody in the future to take full advantage uh, of the entire presentation. So uh, if, if I can get that going, be on the lookout for that. We'll make sure that folks have a way of uh, getting that. Everybody, you can follow updates on the Office of Environmental Education on Twitter. They're North Carolina EE, or you can go to eenorthcarolina.org 
for more information on this lecture series and upcoming events, programs, and offerings from that office. And of course, you can follow the Museum of Natural Sciences on social media. We're at Natural Sciences. And naturalsciences.org also has the upcoming events for this lecture series and even more. Uh, for example, tomorrow night at 7, right here on the museum's YouTube channel, I'll be talking to a crayfish biologist, ecologist, at West Liberty University, Zach Lohman. We'll be talking about some of the endangered crayfish that live in our part of the country. That's tomorrow night at 7 on Science Tonight. Gary, one more time, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thanks for this wonderful opportunity. It was awesome. Thanks for all your help, Chris. Everybody, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you again next time. Bye, folks.